Well, welcome to this week's uh, cardiology news segment. Uh, we'll begin with a study from the Orbit AF registry uh, that looked at uh, over 10,000 patients from 176 practices in the United States uh, with data from uh, mid-2010 to 2011. And this looked at the issue of what are bleeding and ischemic event rates in patients with atrial fibrillation who are also on aspirin. Now, the first finding, this was led by Ben Steinberg, who's done a lot of work with Cardiosaurus, um, that 35% uh, of patients were also taking aspirin in addition to oral anticoagulation. Now, many of them had coronary disease, but a third of those did not have evidence of coronary disease uh, and thus a, a clear indication for the aspirin. And what they observed was, not surprisingly, about a 50% higher rate of bleeding and hospitalization for bleeding over the next six months in those who were also receiving aspirin. Now, they tried to risk adjust uh, patients, and that persisted after multivariate risk adjustment. Um, but these findings highlight, not surprisingly, a higher risk of bleeding with both anticoagulation and antiplatelet therapy. But with the baseline characteristics, call into question the need to review carefully the indication uh, for antiplatelet therapy. I have to say, I often find patients with AFib who are also on aspirin for not a clear reason. Uh, often they're started because they're a cardiac patient. <laughs> So uh, a nice call to review carefully the antithrombotic therapy in AFib patients. And the top picks this week are uh, a pair of studies in the New England Journal studying a new agent for pulmonary arterial hypertension. Um, this is an agent called Rio Siguat, um, which is a, a class of agents that uh, is a soluble guanylate cyclase stimulator. Now, this involves the nitric oxide pathway, which is involved in pulmonary hypertension, um, where uh, impaired nitric oxide release is part of the pathogenesis. Uh, this agent um, increases uh, cyclic uh, GMP and thereby increases nitric oxide and has both vasodilatory and antiproliferative effects in the pulmonary vasculature. Now, published uh, this week are two studies, one in um, group one pulmonary hypertension, which is uh, sort of the standard pulmonary hypertension, but a second one in group four, which is due to chronic thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension. And so the first study, the uh, patent one study, had 443 patients randomized to two different dosing strategies, but the higher dosing strategy against placebo, either on the background uh, therapy that patients were receiving, uh, or some patients were new to uh, therapies, and so not on other background therapies. What was seen was a significant improvement in essentially all the parameters. The six-minute walk test uh, increased by 36 meters, a uh, highly significant difference, but also differences seen in um, pulmonary vascular resistance as measured, um, NT-PRO BNP, and the functional class. And so this was seen in patients not on prior therapy or those on other therapies. And so a, a nice consistent finding of this agent. In the second study, the CHEST-1 study, there were 261 patients. Um, and again, the same improvements were seen, this time a 46-meter uh, increase in um, uh, the six-minute walk test, but similar improvements in pulmonary vascular resistance and, and anti-pro BNP. And this is something where there's an, uh, one of the new indications for this chronic thromboembolism indication. And so an exciting new class of drugs will be reviewed uh, by FDA, uh, but something that we all need to pay attention to to be added to the armamentarium for pulmonary hypertension. So for Cardiosaurus News, I'm Chris Cannon.